I'm Allison Zisco, Editor-in-Chief of HFN and Executive Editor at Home Accents Today. And I am here today with Patricia Russo, who is the Executive Director of the Yale Campaign School. Patty is scheduled to give our keynote address at our Women of Influence event next week, and I promise you, you will not want to miss that. But Patty's also here today to share a few more details about the work that she does and about the leadership roles that women can explore. Patty, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Allison. Great to be here with you. Tell us a little bit more, tell us about the Yale Campaign School, its mission, the work it does, and how you're, what your involvement with it is. Yeah. So our mission is to increase the number of women in running for office, women running campaigns, women in leadership, because as you know, we all know the numbers. We are 51% of the population, yet we have, I don't know, we hover between 20, 25% in the number of women in elected office. That's women in all levels of government. And so our school was founded right after the first year of the woman, 1992. So we've been around for a while. Wow. And back in 1992, before you were born, Allison, <laughs> Not uh, true, but all, <laughs> all of these amazing women running for office uh, for Congress, both on the Democratic and Republican side. So those of us who were active politically, and I was very active politically in Connecticut at the time, were so excited to see all of these women running for office. And we really felt things shifting. You know, we really felt that there was all this incredible energy and support around getting more women in the pipeline and running for office. Now in 1992, the majority of those women who ran for Congress won. So we had Carol Mosley Braun, first African-American woman in her own right, running for the United States Senate in Illinois. She won. Um, uh, um, Ann Richards run her, went, ran and won her gubernatorial campaign in Texas. Uh, just phenomenal wins across the board. So we were feeling pretty good, you know, feeling pretty confident that women were going to see these phenomenal women who ran and won and said, yeah, why not me? It's my turn. I, I want to I wanna be a part of that. But 1993 happened, and it was as if 1992 had never happened. There were really no women running, no, not the numbers that we had anticipated. So our founder, a woman from Westport, Andre Allian Brooks, got together, got, got a group of us together, including Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, who represents the third congressional district in, um, in DC. And her, um, one of her colleagues, Nancy Johnson, who was then a uh, Republican from the fifth congressional district here in Connecticut, and just started talking about why don't we have more women running? Why aren't we seeing more women running? And we decided at that point that, you know, back then there were really no training programs for women. There certainly were no nonpartisan issue neutral political campaign training programs for women. So we started working together, put together a proposal. We knew we wanted it to be nonpartisan. We knew we wanted it to be issue neutral. So you don't have to be pro or con to attend our school of an issue. Um, and we knew we wanted an international component to our school. And we knew we wanted it at Yale University. So the stars aligned and uh, the, a group went over to Yale Law School and met with the dean at the time. And uh, we have been there for 26 years. Wow. So our five day, inten our five day, our five day intensive is usually held each June at Yale Law School, except okay. for this year. Did you hold it virtually this year? I'm sorry? Did you hold it virtually this year? No, we did not. There are so many aspects of the five-day intensive that we cannot replicate virtually. Gotcha. However, um, when the pandemic hit, we have literally hundreds of grads who are running throughout the country, variety of different levels of, com of, um, of office, local, state, and, um, nat and federal that really needed support. No one had run in a pandemic before, Allison. You know, no one had run a campaign during a pandemic. How do I get my message out? How do I make an emotional connection with my voters when I, I can't be in the same room with them? Right. I, this is kind of peak door-to-door -door time. 
no one's opening their door for you, right? How do I connect? So our, um, our phenomenal board and our faculty who teach at the five-day intensive have been working with me since March, and we created a Zoom presentation series called Campaigning in Our New Normal, you know, how to campaign effectively. So each week we have stellar faculty who are usually teaching at our five-day who are starring in a Zoom presentation every week on an aspect of campaigning that will, that will help support and effectively, you know, help women to, to run and win successfully on to November. We've been busy. I'm sure, I'm sure. It's like relearning everything, right? Re exactly. Rethinking how you do everything. Exactly, exactly. Tell me a little bit about, we had talked earlier about how women get involved in campaigns or even in leadership roles and how that differs from men. Um, why, do, why do you think, or from your experience, why do most women get involved in politics? Women usually, traditionally, not every woman, but the majority of them get involved, Allison, because they want to solve a problem, right? It's so beyond themselves as a person. It's about, there's an issue happening with my children. There is an issue happening in my community. There's an issue happening in my state that I'm angry about. And I and want to turn do something that. about it. Exactly. I want to change that anger to action. How do we go about doing that? I use the example of a dear girlfriend of mine uh, who never planned to run for office ever. Again, a happy accident. There was an issue that was uh, going on in her community. Uh, she has been going to many cocktail parties. Everybody in her, her town was talking about it. But nobody was doing anything about it. So she just wrote a letter to the editor innocently and said, I'm concerned about this. If you're concerned about it too, join me at the local diner, 10 o'clock, you know, Saturday morning, and let's talk about it. Well, hundreds of people showed up. Mm -hmm. And she kind of, you know, stood up and became the leader of something that she had you know, no plan of leading, except it was a vacuum. No one else was taking it on. She was very successful and very effective and kind of, you know, grassroots organizing and letter writing campaigns, everything that you have to do to be effective in your, an effective leader in your community. And she was able to successfully uh, deal with the issue. And then a group of people came to her and said, you should run for office. She's like, me, I'm not political. Well, you just did a pretty extraordinary job dealing with this issue that no one else could, could really tackle. Think about it. So she decided to run. She ran for state rep, um, quickly, you know, um, was able to become a leader uh, quickly in, up in the ranks um, in Hartford. And she became our first majority, female majority leader and ultimately our first speaker, female speaker of the house, Moira Lyons. Again, no plan, didn't expect to. Her children were, you know, her boys were grown. She was just active in her community because she loved her town. That's really why women get involved. That's usually why women take a lead. They love their town. They love um, something's going on with their, with their children, with the schools. They want to make an impact. So they use their voices for good. I'm not saying men don't. But women come to the place of um, leadership in a very different path than men. You know, we're, we're much more collaborative in our leadership style, Allison. You know, we're much more easily able to check our egos at the door for the greater good. You know, usually we're dealing with something really complicated, hard, messy. We want to bring everybody in. Right, we want it. We want everybody's voices and everybody's um, commitment, so that we can lift everybody up and really be effective and successful. Uh, I think women are just extraordinary at that. I think it's who we are as a gender. Right? I mean, I'm a wife and a mom, and I feel, and my daughter's thirty, so it's not like she's two, but I still feel I'm, especially right now that we're all here together. Uh, working remotely, um, you know the 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 it's it's interesting watching the balancing act of you know how they look to me and ask me questions that really 
they could take the leadership role on their on their own, you know, behalf and and do it themselves, but they come to me, which is which works. What kind of questions do you get most often? What are people most um, perplexed about or need the most advice about? Well, right now, it's the fear. It's the fear, is this ever going to end? I mean, I remember in the beginning when this started in March, you know, there were still so many unanswered questions, right? There was so much, there was so much unknowing. There was so much fear. There was so much, how, when is this going to end? and how difficult it's been to plan, right? You don't know when you're gonna be out of your house or you thought you were gonna be out of your house, but now there's this second wave that is threatening. So how do I keep my family safe? How do I keep myself safe? Um, how do I be effective when I'm working from home? And there was a great, uh, <laughs> there was a great Twitter uh, post um, from a, uh, a journalist, female journalist who's a mom. And there she is reporting, you know, not missing a beat. She's reporting on the, the pandemic. All the while, she's got her two-year-old son on her lap, comforting him. That's kind of like, that's where we live as women. It's kind of who we are. You know, we multitask, we kind of, you know, make it all happen. And right now, it's all of the unknowing that is making, that is causing a lot of the anxiety and um, the inability of, you know, for people to really feel like they're functioning effectively. I feel as if I'm functioning, but I'm functionally differently. In the beginning, I'm a very social person. I think you can kind of get that feeling. You know, I always say, I love my husband, but my girlfriends are my lifeline. I like, I want out, I want back. I want, you know, I want to be out, you know, speaking to groups and, you know, making connections live. You know, this is great, but it's not like being together, no. right? Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I was having an Italian fit, as I would say. You know, <laughs> the veins were popping out of my neck. I was tapping my toe. Okay, this has been going on for two weeks. Fix it. Like, when is this going to be over? When's it going to be over? Every mm -hmm. woman in America kind of feels that way, right? Okay, like enough of this. Um, and then as the weeks have progressed, and as I mentioned, this is my now my, starting my 17th week in uh, quarantine, um, I'd say in the middle of April, I found my flow. I found my, you know what, calm down. This is the way it's going to be for now. Not forever, but this is the way it's going to be for now. So things had to shift in my life personally in order for me to be, to be vibrant and fabulous and stay in my amazing lane, um, I had a shift. And that's what women are finding, that it's different right now and it's going to be different for a while, but it doesn't mean that you can't be amazing. You can't be, you just have to find it. You know, you have every reason to feel like you're in a, you know, in a funk. You know, there's so many things we can't do. I mean, in the beginning, I would think, do I want to go outside? Oh, I'd have to put my mask on if I like it was some big deal. Now it's like, yes, I want to go outside and I'll happily put my but mask on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just kind of become the norm for mm -hmm. us, right? And so that's just what it's going to be for now. And just kind of surrendering to that and that knowing that it's for now. It's not forever. It's for now. So all the training, I'd like to mention that all the training that we've been doing has been free of charge. Because okay. you'll recall, Allison, in the beginning of the pandemic, we also started to see our economy plummet. And I said to the board, I don't want money to be one more obstacle, one more barrier to women getting the support that they need. So I'm happy to say that as of, you know, right now through election day, everything that we're doing is free of charge. It's it's our way of just kind of giving back, you know, doing our part. Doing our part. And how many people? Well, your 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 school was canceled for this year, but how many people would you say you work with on a given oh. on a given week? Well, the Zoom we've opened the Zoom calls to not only our grads but anybody who's running for office. Because right now, anybody who's run for office, they've never been through a pandemic. Right. Uh, campaign either so we've opened it up which is why i believe we have between we have between three and five hundred attendees every week wow yes 
That's phenomenal. So the need is tremendous. Everybody's so grateful that it's free and the information is so good and so helpful. And I get so many texts and emails and, and notes from people who are so grateful um, for the assistance, the quality of the assistance and the fact that it's free of charge. That's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about um, outside of the political realm, because I think a lot of the tips and advice that you give to women can also be applied to their personal or their professional lives, right? Mm -hmm. So how, so let's talk a bit about different leadership styles, how women can assume greater roles of leadership in the work that they do from day to day and even in their home lives, but let's talk professionally if you would. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is that women have got to practice self-care. That's the number one. Leadership comes from within, in my opinion, okay? It's really not about what's going on outside. It's really about how you feel about yourself. Do you feel confident? Do you feel calm? Right now, it's been really difficult for people to find peace and calm, right? Because of the, of the external forces of the unknowing. Find some peace and calm, whatever that looks like for you. I have a whole practice, as I like to say to girlfriends, this doesn't just happen. I've got to make it happen. I make it. And it's so important to me because I love feeling like this all the time, that it's worth the investment. Mm -hmm. Women have to appreciate that they're amazing and they are worth their own investment. You know, how often have we said, you know, it's always the job that's the priority. My family's the priority. You, most women are not even on their priority list, let alone number one. In order to take care of everybody, in order to be most, your most confident uh, self, effective, successful self, that starts here. It starts within. So it's about doing some kind of a quiet practice. Now, I meditate. That just works for me. Uh, I meditate in the morning, kind of revs me up. It's a beautiful way to start the day. It lifts my energy. But the beauty about meditation, it also calms you down at night. So I know we, some people are having difficulty sleeping right now, Allison. Your mind is just racing, right? Um, I have a pad and a pen, right, on my bedside table. And I just kind of like download my brain of everything I think I'm going to forget. And Let's face it, we're women. We don't usually forget. But, you know, in order to calm down and just relax, in order to get a good night's sleep, let's just write it down and just download it. And then I also meditate at night when I get into bed. And it is a wonderful way to just calm yourself down and get into a nice, relaxing, deep sleep. There's so many free online apps and, and applications on meditation and how to get started that I would highly recommend um, uh, people take a look into it. But it could be stillness. It could be breathing. It could be prayer. Whatever works for you to calm you down. So what advice would you give to women who are in leadership positions? How do they, what are the most effective tools for motivating other people to get behind a project or a cause or, you know, to go in a new direction? What, what, what skills do you need to develop? Um, a, a sense of, I really want this to do this and it can't just be about me. I really want to bring in a collective group of, um, kindred spirits who are, you know, willing and interested in, in being a part of that leadership. And again, I think women do that really well. Uh, you know, I don't have to be the only star. I can bring in other stars, um, to help again, amplify the issue, lift us all up. Um, staying in touch, again, either using social media, which is very, very effective. Um, Facebook in particular, uh, you'll see if you go on Facebook right now, people are sharing interesting articles, um, a lot of inspirational messaging, um, just kind of like, oh, this is what I'm, you know, what I'm thinking, thoughts. And just kind of get that kind of conversation going, being very intentional about ultimately what you would like to achieve. Because we, can't, because we can't get together for a lunch or a dinner and brainstorm, but we can do it via social media. We can do it via Zoom. Um, you know, and, and, and so let's use 
what we have available to us right now in order to be effective. You can still be effective. You just have to shift and using other, other um, you know, ways of getting your message out more effectively. Um, tell me a little bit, let's talk a little bit historically about the roles of women in leadership, women in leadership roles and how that has evolved from 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Do we expect the same thing of women leaders that we did 10 years ago? Yeah. And then the other part of the question is, do we expect the same thing of women leaders that we do of men, male leaders? I think we expect a lot more from our women leaders than we do from our men. I just do. I mean, right. I, um, I just think because I think that we as a gender are really hard on ourselves. Um, I think that our expectations of ourselves are in some way uh, reflected. And uh, so we are so demanding of ourselves personally. And oftentimes we will just deflect that onto a woman leader. Whereas sometimes we'll give men a pass, a male leader a pass, not so much with women, you know, not so much with women. Do you um, think so, that men feel that way too? I don't know what they feel, quite frankly. I, you know, I know that men, uh, you know, we talk about the two paths to um, a man versus a woman running for office and how a man gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, gets dressed, I'm going to run for the United States Senate today. It never occurs to him that, of course, he should run, that he's qualified, never run for office before, wakes up, he's doing it. Um, never occurs to a man that he's not going to get the support he feels he rightly deserves. Never occurs to him that he's not going to be able to raise the money. Uh, and never occurs to him that he's going to be able to um, create a groundswell of support and enthusiasm for his campaign. Women, not so much. Wow, I don't, you know, I've never run before. I, I don't know anything about running for office. Who's gonna vote for me? I can't raise that kind of money. That's a lot of money for, you know, for a Senate seat. $10 million is kind of the minimum. Is it? To raise the entry point? Right, and that's uncontested. I don't know that many people. Who's gonna vote? So men, don't, you know, are talking themselves into running and taking the chance and women are like oh wow i have like 20 reasons why talking themselves happen. out of running you know, right. yeah yeah now we're seeing less and less of that um definitely political campaign training has leveled the playing field it's made a world of difference i think everybody needs to be trained quite frankly allison uh, not just women but men too um politics is a business and it's a very expensive one so when you're getting quality a campaign training, as you would at the campaign school at Yale, you're going to avoid all those expensive rookie mistakes that you're never going to make because you know better. So there's that. Um, what we have seen in our 26 years um, of our history is, you know, when we started out, the majority of the women who attended our five-day intensive were women in their mid-40s. Their children were grown. You know, they were kind of launched. And they actually had, you know, time, you know, I had always wanted to run for office and, but I was so busy with my kids right. and at home and working. I just really didn't have the time. And now they have a block of time and they were predominantly white. Now, fast forward to, oh gosh, around 2007, 2008, which is right around what I call the Obama phenomenon. We started seeing more and younger women of color who had either taken time off from work or taking time off from school, who had worked on the Obama campaign, and were like, I kind of love this. I love it. Yeah. I want to do more of it. I want to learn how to be a more effective leader in my own community. I think I'm going to run for office, or I think I want to run a campaign for someone I care, I feel passionately about. So back in 2002, 2008, that's when we started seeing younger women come to our school, and more women of color coming to our school. That's so now our, you know, our average age is, you know, early thirties. Wow, it's dropped about 10 years, huh? Exactly. Yeah. And the majority of the women who are coming to our school are women of color. So we look like America. You know, we really are um, an, an, an accurate reflection of our world, you know, in our country, which is really, really exciting. And then- It is exciting. 
we have the additional layer of women coming from other countries. So eight to 10% of the women who come to our school every year are from other parts of the world, which I think adds a richness and a texture to our school that you won't find elsewhere. A couple of years ago, we had a woman named Ka Wala who was running for president of Cameroon. And she had been detained from coming on time because she had been kidnapped by her opponents. Now we have many challenges as women running for office here. Thankfully, I always look for wood. Thankfully, that is not one. Yet. Kidnapping, no, not usually. She kind of recovered. I said, Ka, you need to address your, your class and you need to talk to them about the challenges that international women face when they leave, literally risking their lives, putting their lives on the line every day in order to run for office. This is going to be a broad question, but... Are you hopeful for the future? I am you know? hopeful. I am, and I think I am so hopeful because of the work that I do. I see phenomenal women running. I see men as allies, which is really important. So I've got men who are coming to our school who want to be trained by us because they're running campaigns for women candidates. And they'll call me and they're like, Patty, I need to get on this Zoom call or I need to meet with you because I've never run as a woman before. I have no idea the challenges that my candidate's gonna face just because of her gender. Mm -hmm. So that's the exciting thing that we're seeing. We're seeing more and more men stepping up, wanting to be a part of a female candidate's success. That's really encouraging. Yeah. That's good. And I think, you know, when you do something, like you'll see there's a lot of ranting on Facebook. Just mm -hmm. like spend five minutes on Facebook and you just wanna just like jump out a window. And what I say, to many of these women is go do something. Go do something. Go sign up um, and do something for the League of Women Voters. If there's a candidate out there that you feel passionately about, make phone calls for them, write postcards for them. You'll stay safe in your home, but you will feel this sense of accomplishment and achievement. Um, it'll make you feel more hopeful for the world because you're in it. You know, you're actually doing something. You're taking a lead. You're taking a lead to make a difference in the world. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, on that note, <laughs> on that encouraging note, thank you so much for your time. My thank pleasure. you so much for the encouragement. For all of you who are listening, please tune in next week during our Women of Influence event. Patty, as I mentioned earlier, will be giving the keynote address. Um, and we'd love for you to join us for that and to celebrate all of our um, nominees, our Women of Influence nominees, and to celebrate their success and their leadership. So please join us. Thank you, Patty. My pleasure. Thank you, Allison. Bye-bye.